wiring diagrams. In the first part of the program, we reviewed what makes electric current flow and how different circuits are wired. We looked at problems in a circuit and different types of test equipment. Equipment like the alternator tester and the HEI tester are designed for particular components and can help you with specific problems. But when you're still looking for a possible cause and there's no specialized equipment, you need to know how to follow a wiring diagram and how to use your basic test instruments. That's what we'll be looking at in this part of the program. Wiring diagrams for troubleshooting have become a lot easier to read. To see how much they've changed, let's quickly recall what they used to look like. This is how a wiring diagram was explained a few years ago in a previous training program. The major sections were separated by color highlights, front end, instrument panel, and rear end. Everything was in black and white, so the wire colors had to be written in. All the wires appeared the same size, and you had to trace the circuit you wanted through all the others. And the diagrams had no explanation of component operation or location. The new troubleshooting diagrams are more suited to the complexity of present day electrical systems. Let's look at the key features. The troubleshooting manual breaks the entire electrical system down into individual circuits. You notice right away the diagrams are visually oriented. The wires are shown in color. You can follow a circuit as if the harness was open for you to see the wires. The diagram's laid out like a page in a book. You read it from top to bottom to follow circuit operation. It shows the idea of current flowing from source to ground. Everything about the circuit is together on one page. When it's hot, information on component operation, and cross-references to fuses and other components. You follow the diagram, and as you go, you can check circuit operation. You can stop at a component and find its location here or here. The fuse block is a kind of dividing line in the electrical system. In the case of most circuits, power is fed in on this side and is then distributed to several circuits. The wiring diagrams present this arrangement visually. The charging and power distribution circuits are shown only as far as the fuse block, where the individual diagrams pick up the circuits. This arrow indicates the circuit you're looking at connects with another one. In troubleshooting, for example, you may have to check more than one circuit. In this example, the defogger and the power seats are protected by the same circuit breaker. A problem in one circuit will cause the other to be inoperative if the circuit breaker opens. The ground side of a circuit is as important as the feed side. Clusters of components, such as lights, using a common ground are shown on a separate diagram as well as on their own circuit. Some manuals also have drawings and schematics of the fuse block and multiple connectors in the system. The cavities, wire colors, and circuits are identified. Individual switch terminals may also be shown with their circuit. The terminals are numbered to make continuity checks simpler and more accurate. As you trace a circuit, you'll come across symbols of different components and sometimes an explanation of how they operate. These are switches. Switches can be located in two positions between the power feed and the load, and between the load and ground. When you close a switch in the middle of a circuit, current flows to the component and ground. A light switch is a typical example of this kind of switch. Or the switch can make the ground connection and complete the circuit. A typical example is the door jam switch for the courtesy lights. Switches are always shown in their position before operation. The switches you see here are described as normally open. They must be closed to operate the circuit. This is the symbol for a relay. This one is in the horn circuit. 
When the horn button is pressed, the relay is energized. It closes the contacts, allowing current to flow to the horns. In this type of circuit, current is controlled by relay contacts. They operate in two positions, allowing current flow in either direction. In one position, they allow current flow through one set of contacts, and the other set acts as a ground return. In the other position, the contacts direct current flow through the other wire, reversing the direction of the motor. Depending on which circuit is operating, you can think of the contacts as open or closed. The last type of switch we'll look at are thermally operated contacts, like the flashers in the turn signal and hazard warning circuits. The thermal elements alternately heat up and cool down as voltage is applied, causing the signals to blink on and off. Notice the turn signal flasher contacts are normally closed, while the hazard warning contacts are normally open. Diagnosis. We've seen how circuit diagrams are organized and looked at some component symbols. Now, let's see how a troubleshooting diagram can help you with this repair order, asking you to fix the passenger side power window. It's stuck open and it won't go up using either control switch. First, verify the problem by trying the window. Before you do anything else, study the wiring diagram to trace current flow. You see the circuit is hot with the ignition in run. Because of the high stall current drop and the possibility of damaging the circuit or wiring, the entire circuit is protected by a circuit breaker. Here, the feed splits, applying voltage to both switches. Let's trace the faulty circuit. The driver wants to close the window again. He closes the normally open up switch here at his switch. Voltage is applied to the normally closed up switch on the passenger side. It goes through the motor and back to ground through the normally closed down switch here and the downside of the switch on the driver's side, here, to ground. If the passenger switch is put in the up position, current is applied through a separate feed wire, here. From the switch, current follows the same path as from the driver's switch, through the motor, and back through the downside of both switches to ground. By tracing the circuit, you've answered some important questions for diagnosis. You know how and where current flows to operate the power windows. You know what and where the components are. And you've identified a special feature, the common ground for the motor and the two switches. Now, simply by matching wire colors directly, you can identify the circuits you may need to check. The feed wire is pink, and these two dark blue and white, and tan and white, go to the passenger side. Because the circuit breaker is okay, you don't have a short, so check continuity first. Connect a 12 volt test light to a good ground. Turn the ignition key to run and check the driver switch for voltage on the feed side. And at each outlet terminal, while you operate the switch. Everything checks out so far. At the passenger's door switch, test the blue and brown output wires. Operate the up switch from the passenger side and the driver's side. This proves you have continuity from the driver's switch to the passenger switch through the blue and white wire. Operate the down switch from the passenger side and the driver's side. No light. There's no continuity in the tan and white wire from the driver's door switch. Does this agree with what we know about the circuit? Let's make a mark here. 
to indicate a possible open and double check circuit operation. This was the current flow when the driver tried to close the window. From his switch, through the passenger switch, the motor, as far as here. Current for the passenger switch comes from here, to the upside of the switch. But then, the circuit is the same. So the window couldn't be closed from either side. In this instance, you use the wiring diagram and the test light to perform a logical series of checks to isolate the open. Let's say you're faced with the opposite problem. The passenger side window works, except when it's lowered from the driver's side. Then the circuit breaker opens. The circuit breaker is your best clue. There's a short somewhere in the circuit from the driver's down switch to the motor or in the switch itself. For there to be a short circuit, the problem must be ahead of the load, reducing circuit resistance and causing high current draw. But since the passenger's down circuit is all right, the separate feed wire must be all right. And this part must have good continuity as well. So we're left with this section between the switches. If there's a short here, it seems puzzling at first that the up switches work, since this is their return side. What's happening is that the short is acting as a ground on the return side. But on the feed side, it's shorting ahead of the load and opening the circuit breaker. You can verify that you have a short to ground by making a check with an ohmmeter or a self-powered test light. First, disconnect the connectors from the driver's switch and the passenger side switch. Connect the test lamp to a good ground. Probe the disconnected wire. If the test lamp lights, you've proven there's a ground in the tan and white wire as you expected. Locate the ground and repair it. Let's look at a slightly different type of circuit before going on to the practice problems. The horn circuit is a basic example of how a relay controls current. Pressing the horn switch completes a ground and current energizes the relay coil. The contacts close, allowing current to flow to the horns. Now let's assume these horns don't work. There are several ways to approach the problem. Naturally, you'd check the fuse first, either visually or by operating another component on the same fuse circuit. In this case, the courtesy lights are on the same circuit. Then you can use jumper wires to go directly from the horns to the battery. You're not bypassing any load, so the circuit is safe. If the horns work, a logical sequence is then to follow the current flow and make checks at the most accessible points first to find the malfunctioning component. Check for voltage at the multiple connector in the engine compartment. The correct cavity is identified at the beginning of the troubleshooting section. If you have voltage here, You've checked continuity to the horn switch and the relay coil and contact. If there's no voltage, check for voltage on the feed side of the relay with the test instrument connected to ground. If there is still no voltage, you'd have to ground the relay coil at the steering column connector, bypassing the horn switch ground. Now, it's time for some practice problems. After I've read the questions, we'll go through the problem and check your answers. Practice problems. You're checking a malfunction in the blower motor circuit. Here's the relevant part of the wiring diagram. This is the blower switch, and here are the resistors. What is the quickest way to check the blower switch and the resistors? Which test instrument would you use? And what would you expect it to indicate? The quickest way to check the resistors is to connect a voltmeter or 12 volt test lamp between the outlet terminal B and ground. 
You can see that with the blower switch in the low position, current is always applied in the resistors from the air conditioning selector switch. This tests all the resistors for the three lower speeds. If any one of them is defective, you won't get a reading on the VOM or the test lamp won't light. To test a switch, you'd have to attach your VOM or test light at each outlet terminal in turn and turn the switch to that speed and see if you have continuity. You only need to check medium low, medium high, and high because checking the resistors also checked continuity through the low position of the switch. The customer says the oil pressure warning light stays on all the time, but he knows the oil level is correct. What's the best way to check the oil pressure warning circuit? Assuming engine oil pressure is good. One, look for a short to ground in the wire between the oil pressure switch and the warning light. Two, make a continuity check through the oil pressure switch. Three, Disconnect the feed wire at the sender and ground it to see if the light goes off and comes on again. Four. All of them are good ways. The answer is four. All of them are good ways. However, the quickest way is probably number three. Disconnect the wire and use a jumper to ground it to see if the light goes up and then comes on again. If it didn't go off, then you'd look for a ground somewhere in the wire between the sender and the warning light, which is answer number one. Checking the sender in the engine, answer number two, is probably the last test you'd make. This checks if the contacts are stuck closed, keeping the warning light on, even when oil pressure is high enough to open them. Here's a typical courtesy and dome light circuit. Study the circuits to the three lights, and then answer this question. All three lights are on all the time. What's the problem, and how would you locate it? What makes this circuit different is that the switches are on the ground side of the load. A ground anywhere on this side of the load will cause the lamps to light. For example, a ground between the driver's door switch and the light switch caused by worn insulation would complete all three circuits. The left-hand courtesy light, the right-hand courtesy light, and the dome light. The door jam switch completes the circuits by making a ground connection. The unintentional ground is doing the same thing and acting like another switch. Because the three switches are on the ground side, the ground circuits form one continuous circuit. You can't find the unintentional ground with the usual test instruments. You can only prove what you already know. That is, there's continuity through the different grounds, the unintentional ground and the switches. In this situation, you can confirm what you suspect with a self-powered test light. But the diagram in the troubleshooting manual is your best diagnostic tool. Use the diagram to trace the routing of wires between the lights and switches. Then, check at the points where the wires go through body sheet metal and grommets for wear points that could be causing the unintentional ground. There are more practice problems in the reference book, and you'll be doing those in a moment. But for now, that concludes the second part of the electrical diagnosis program. We've stressed using the wiring diagrams in the manual before you make any tests. Understanding current flow and circuit operation can help you use your test equipment to troubleshoot problems more effectively. Keep the basic principles from part one in mind. What makes up a circuit? How to connect your meters? What they can measure and how to interpret the information? You'll take a lot of the mystery out of diagnosing electrical systems. In question A, you were asked, with the blower switch in high and the other switches in the positions shown, you cannot get a voltmeter reading at terminal A of the blower relay. What could be the problem? When the answers appear below, choose the one you selected in the workbook by pressing the corresponding number on the touchpad. The answer you chose is correct. Only a defective AC function selector switch would prevent all current flow to the blower relay through both the blower switch and the blower resistors. Thus, 
there is no voltage reading at blower relay terminal A. With any of the other conditions, current would still be able to reach terminal A, either from the blower resistors or from the fusible link through blower relay terminals D or C. The answer you chose is incorrect. The correct answer is number two. Only a defective AC function selector switch would prevent all current flow to the blower relay through both the blower switch and the blower resistors. Thus, there is no voltage reading at blower relay terminal A. With any of the other conditions, current would still be able to reach terminal A either from the blower resistors or from the fusible link through blower relay terminals D or C. This was question B. The tailgate lock does not work. Testing at the motor connectors, you find voltage in circuit 195 with the switch in the lock position and voltage in circuit 194 with the switch in the unlock position. Which of the following is a possible problem? When the answers appear below, choose the one you selected in the workbook by pressing the corresponding number on the touchpad. You correctly chose answer number four. After making the test described, a poor connection at G132 is a possible problem. You would have to make an additional check here for a poor ground connection which is still preventing continuity in the circuit. By testing for voltage at the motor connectors with the switch in both positions, you eliminate the circuit breaker and connectors 137 and 138 as possible causes of the problem. The answer you chose is incorrect. The correct answer is number four. After making the test described, a poor connection at G132 is a possible problem. You would have to make an additional check here for a poor ground connection, which is still preventing continuity in the circuit. By testing for voltage at the motor connectors with a switch in both positions, you eliminate the circuit breaker and connectors 137 and 138 as possible causes of the problem. This was the problem in question C. The left-hand high beam headlamp does not light with the dimmer switch in the high beam position. Which of these would you suspect first? When the answers appear below, choose the one you selected in the workbook by pressing the corresponding number on the touchpad. Answer number four is the correct response to this question. With an inoperative high beam headlamp, the first thing you'd suspect is the headlamp itself. Test for continuity through the headlamp. It's probably burned out. Naturally, you'd make the other checks if you tested the headlamp and found it to be all right. Your selection was not the correct answer to this question. The correct answer is number four. The first thing you'd suspect with an inoperative high beam headlamp is the headlamp itself. Test for continuity through the headlamp. It's probably burned out. You'd make the other checks listed if you tested the headlamp and found it to be all right. Question D contained this problem. This is the wiring diagram for the power seat. It operates normally in all modes except rear up or down, which does not work at all. Which meter would you use and where would you test for continuity? When the answers appear below, Choose the one you selected in the workbook by pressing the corresponding number on the touchpad. Answer number one is correct. You rightly suppose that if the power seat operates in all modes except rear up or down, the motor and the relay controlling solenoid operation are functioning correctly. The only components left that control rear seat height are the switch and the solenoid. So your first check was for continuity through the switch to the solenoid at terminal E. Of course, if you found voltage here, you'd go on to check at switch terminals D and F. Finally, you'd test the solenoid. The answer you chose is not correct. The correct answer is number one, for the following reasons. If the power seat operates in all modes except rear, up, or down, the motor and the relay controlling the solenoid are all right. So it's not really worthwhile checking the relay and motor again for continuity. The only components left that control rear seat height are the switch and the solenoid. The only check listed for these two is through the switch to the solenoid at terminal E. If you found voltage here, you'd go on to check at switch terminals D and F. Finally, 
you'd test the solenoid. This was the situation in question E. You verify a customer complaint that the car is overheating. With the ignition on, you disconnect the wire at the coolant temperature switch and ground the wire. Which of the following can you be certain is true? When the answers appear below, choose the one you selected in the workbook by pressing the corresponding number on the touchpad. You are right. Answer number one is correct. If you ground the temperature sender wire and the fan runs, you can be sure the sender is bad. As you correctly assumed, if the fan does not run after grounding the wire, you can be sure the sender is not bad. But you can't be sure that only the fan motor or only the relay is bad. It could be either one or both. Your answer was not correct. The correct answer is number one. If you ground the temperature sender wire and the fan then runs, you can be sure that the sender is bad. However, if the fan still doesn't run, you can't be sure whether it's the fan motor or the relay or both or something else. You can be sure the sender is not bad if the fan doesn't run after you ground the temperature switch wire.